Chronic Hoosier joining us. Chronic, it was uh, a – we've talked about this, but a, uh, I know you're a big fan, so it's with kicking the nuts last night, to be honest with you, for uh, Indiana fans. Yes, yes, it was. Uh, penalty kicks are probably the uh, the cruelest thing in all of sports. Uh, it just uh, terribly unfortunate. Um, tip your, cat, your your hat to, to Syracuse for a team that had never made it that far before. I thought they uh, – they showed a lot of poise, a lot of resiliency. Uh, incredibly proud of IU's effort, though, for a, a first half that really looked rough. Uh, the way they were able to make the adjustments at halftime really dig in, and uh, you know, I thought they dominated the second half. I thought they, uh, I thought they won both the overtime periods, but just didn't get it in net. And uh, when it comes down to those kicks, it's it's such a fickle, fickle uh, way to end a game. But uh, I, the nice thing is a lot of youth on this team uh, don't expect to see too, too many, um, you know, early attritions, although it's always something that you deal with when you're out there recruiting the best players in the nation, but uh, look for them to, to reload as they always do. And if history is any guide, they're going to be back really, really soon. So, uh, you know, for all the disappointment and kind of had to take a step back last night and recognize <laughs> just how impressive it is that they're able to find themselves in those positions, uh, however heartbreaking they may end at times, uh, to be there so consistently, uh, especially in the last, you know, half decade plus. Uh, really, really remarkable. Yep, absolutely, and hope that that continues. It is uh, one of the most, uh, if not the most, stunning run in all of collegiate sports. There's, I can't imagine anything um, that equals it. Would have nice been nice to see him get one of the one of the last three trips have just um all three have just been heartbreakers for Indiana uh, since they've won their last title in 2012. Yeah, there's no there's no good way to exit uh you know a tournament. Uh it's just really difficult when you see yourself, you know, title game in uh in 17 ends in overtime, uh title game in 20 ends in overtime against Marshall. A um, couple of overtime losses uh, mixed in between there as well in the Sweet 16. And then uh, to go to PKs uh, after being down, you know, found themselves down twice and were able to battle back. Uh, just really, really, really tough pill to swallow. But so is the uh, so is the life of the Indiana Soccer Hoosiers. Uh, you'd only win so many national titles because you get there so frequently. And um, the fact that they they continue to find themselves in the cup in the national title game, uh, just a testament to how incredibly strong that program is. But also, and I said it last night, you know, everybody talking about, you know, woe is me after the the, the result out in Las Vegas for the basketball team. Uh, no doubt, I feel that pain. I think a lot of people do. But keeping the ultimate goal in mind, you're not supposed to be playing your best ball, at least in basketball, in December. You know, same with soccer. Uh, if you would ask me or pretty much anybody that follows the sport late October, early November, what their uh, what their ceiling for this team was, I, my guess is very few would have said the national title game. Uh, but as Indiana soccer is, is prone to do, they continue to get better as the season goes on. Uh, once tournament play comes in, they find another gear and uh, they just keep going as long as their engine will push them. And uh, in this case, it was just one PK short, but it's it's amazing uh, what that type of team building, that type of development, that type of culture can produce uh, when you got the right pieces inside of it. It's certainly an aspir something for a, a lot of programs to model themselves off of because it you know it's it's more than just the uh, the the saying they truly have built a tradition of excellence. So, a little perspective for the basketball team uh, coming off that tough loss, and as they're facing another very very tough game on the road here this weekend. Uh, Let's let's see some growth. Let's see some development. And let's see where these guys can end up uh, come March. Now, there is one thing that I have uh, made bones about, and and it, maybe it's off the mark because I did I started it started with me with Indiana playing Marshall in soccer, and I just it grates me when I look at a roster that is ninety percent foreign players. It's not that I have anything against foreign players. What I have a problem with is it's just like the leagues in Europe, like where Jordan Holes played in Germany. You're only allowed two Americans on any roster. I agree with that. I think that's exactly how it should be in college. Uh, now, it'll differ from sport to sport, but I think that there should be 
a number, a, a set number. You've got to have kids from America on your on your team. These are American universities. Not that they can't go, but now on these days, I, I don't want to see teams going over to and stocking programs with kids from Europe, which is exactly what Arizona has. They have eight or nine foreigners on their roster. And it, it's just like building a, a, a Euro, European all-star team. Well, I think I, I I think that's kind of the direction things are going, to be honest with you. And it's not just with the teams. I mean, it's it's the broader university. Um, just look at the complexion of IU student body. Uh, walk across campus. And, you know, I, I think that's reflective of what you see across the universities across the country. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, they are open to all, uh, no matter the nationality. And, uh, you know, it, it very much is more and more looking like semi-pro. But, you know, when you look at this day and age of college athletics now with NIL and and all the uh, the changes coming, uh, I think that's just part and parcel of the uh, of the transformation of of NCAA athletics as a whole, to be totally honest. Um, and I, I think you're going to continue to see a trend in that direction. Now, nobody says you can't go out and recruit uh, international players. Um, you know, those are all choices that programs have to make. Um, you know, whatever your, uh, whatever your recipe is, I, that's I, yours to choose yours to follow, um, and yours to, to, to deal with the results. You know, we've seen, uh, Indiana, you know, soccer has, has mainly kept the same recruiting footprint for the past 50 years. They love the Ohio Valley. They love Midwestern kids, particularly Chicago and, uh, St. Louis. And Missouri that's what system. I love and, and it aggravates me because uh, you see someone like Todd, De- Todd Yeagley who was recruiting kids from Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, uh, and St. Louis, but developing talent, taking yeah. kids and developing talent. And that's what it, that's why it, it aggravates me because, and another reason is you bring all these kids in from, from uh, Europe and eh, regulations over there are not exactly what you'd call stringent. Um, you know, so it's, they're allowed to do things. It's just, I think there should be a limit and I'm not moving off of that. Um, yeah, you know, I'll say this in counterpoint, even Indiana soccer cashed in a couple titles with a bunch of Russians, uh, mixed in with that same group. So, you know, it, it's, it's whatever, whatever pieces you choose. Um, you know, I, 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 I suppose in a, uh, a nation as compacted, uh, and as diverse as Europe is, um, from a fan's perspective, uh, perhaps you have a, a better, uh, you know, marketing angle when you're promoting mainly domestic players. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I think college athletics kind of like the professional ranks here in the United States, they're going to consistently strive to put the very best product on the field, uh, no matter where those, those kids are coming from. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, um, that you lose, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, who you lose to and what what's on their birth certificate that's i I just i don't know i'm gonna i'm gonna agree to disagree with you on that one because at the end of the day you know look at look at the basketball team you know terry morin is is inching more and more towards that uh you know just wide open take the best from wherever they come from and she's she's reaping some dividends here now we'll see if that if that's a pattern that um that continues uh, but at least for now, as this team's currently constructed, you know, whether it be transfers, whether it be international players, they're going out and getting the best they can. Um, I, I do agree with you that, you know, the the documentation issue can become a little challenging when you start dealing with, uh, you know, international records keeping. Uh, but, you know, we deal with it all the time on the academic side. Uh, certainly you don't have the same requirements or regulations controlling who you can enroll as a student, you know, what their birth has to be and whether or not they got paid. But I think that also kind of highlights some of the absurdities of the, uh, the NCAA's current amateurism model, because quite frankly, you know, if you want a $200 a week stipend for some, you know, third tier European club, is that really any different than having your entire summer's travel and, and gear and meals paid for by an AAU program? I mean, those are benefits just the same. They may not be cash, but they're in kind. So I don't know. I think they've muddied the water so much with these regulations that it makes it really difficult to see a, a clear picture about who is and who isn't, uh, you know, rightfully eligible to compete. I cannot disagree with you there, brother. Uh, Indiana now moves, have the week off for finals to study until they take on the Kansas Jayhawks at Fog Allen. And 
they're going to experience. Uh, I know you probably weren't, didn't, were not, was not able to make the trip to Las Vegas. And first of all, uh, Chronic, we've talked about it. Shocked, shocked, shocked. At I, I was with Dean Garrett and we were having lunch, and and I've said this already, but he was telling me that, hey man, he goes, this is not going to be a neutral game. Though I know Indiana fans think that because, but Arizona travels well. He goes, I know Indiana does as well, but we get there and he he was shocked. It. I'm telling you, it was 85% Indiana fans and found out maybe how they possibly got their hands on so many Arizona tickets. Jennifer mentioned earlier, she found a, a, a an Arizona pre-sale code on Twitter and used that. And I think it must have, a lot of other people may have done the same because it was unbelievable, the Indiana crowd out there. Yeah, you know, that's it's something that uh, you see reflected right now in ticket prices for IU games. Um, there's been a lot of pinup demand uh, over the last several years. Uh, Indiana fans pining to get back to national relevance, pining to see them compete at the highest level against the best teams uh, outside of the conference, not just during the conference portion of the schedule. And just what a, a cathartic release this year has been. So not surprising the least bit. Um, I don't know that you're going to see quite that that uh, that number of support out in Lawrence this weekend just because this is a, no. a true home and away game. Uh, but I do know just from my own, you know, my own text right now, uh, I can probably list at least four or five dozen uh, friends of mine. Uh, close friends of mine, they're going to be traveling out there, which I just think is testament to uh, to Indiana fans' excitement uh, to see a team that's competitive again. And, you know, while it was uh, unfortunate that that many people made it out to the desert uh, and didn't quite get the result we wanted, uh, I'm looking at that game thinking, you know, just how, how valuable that can be down the road for this program uh, to get into a neutral court setting, uh, such as that, you know, it, it almost like you had a tournament in uh, in Indy or somewhere close by uh, come March where you're going to see an inordinate amount, a disproportionate amount of Indiana fans traveling and supporting in a gym that's, you know, not in state. Um, it's it's just, a, I think it's a healthy sign for the program. Um, you know, the big thing now is going to be you got to win those games. Uh, I was just having a conversation with my traveling buddy for this weekend uh, about how many trips we've taken for these marquee games and left disappointed. And while you love to see them back in the mix, uh, you would certainly love even more to see them start getting some results. Um, but at the end of the day, those things just don't happen overnight. You don't go from, you know, uh, nationally irrelevant back to uh, the top of the mountain without some growing pains and, and some setbacks uh, to fuel that growth that it's going to take to get there. So looking at a game like uh, last Saturday's, uh, there's certainly a lot of tape for them to dissect and to learn from and hopefully to grow from so that maybe the next one of those trips is, uh, is a little more promising. I agree with you, man. It, uh, regardless, it should be another electric, uh, environment looking forward to that. But I agree with you. What I, when I went down to, uh, the, the Cameron indoor when the last time Indiana played Duke, I was a little surprised with how many Indiana fans were able to make it in there. So I will not be surprised to, to, to see exactly what you talked about. Um, this this Saturday, Jalen Hutchinson. The big question on whether when uh, he's going to be back. Will he be back for this game? And uh, we've seen how much Indiana needs him. Although, you know, in the Arizona game, Chronic, they 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 shot the ball they pretty well, especially after a, a an abysmal start to the game. They ended up shooting twenty five three pointers and hitting forty percent of those, the exact number that Arizona had. They just got beat. Uh, they got beat inside and at the free throw line. Oh, 100%. And, they, you know, they they shot themselves in the foot. Uh, you know, basically at the five-minute mark there, maybe a little bit before then, I think Arizona put together something like a 25-4 to four run and just absolutely nothing Seven, could go. 17 to nothing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely nothing went right for the Hoosiers during that stretch. And, you know, uh, most of their turnovers happened during that period. Arizona converted every one of those turnovers into points. Uh, at least on average, it was just really remarkable how quickly things got away. But once they were able to settle back in, you know, that game reminded me a ton of the uh, the NCAA tournament in 2012. Uh, Indiana's rematch with Kentucky, who went on to win the national championship. Uh, you know, a young Indiana team showed themselves, showed the world that they could run with what was probably the best offense in the country that year and probably played the best tournament game 
of the entire uh, the entire tournament. Uh, it was just a high powered shootout, and they they unfortunately came up short. But I, I think the lessons the team took from that on on what it takes to compete at the highest level, on you know just seeing what they're capable of in that environment when the lights are the brightest, and and you know. I, I think there was there was growth that came from that. So hopefully Indiana learned a little bit something about themselves and what it's going to take to compete. But you know, quite frankly, uh, they were uh, they were woefully deficient uh, when it came to the the battle in the paint, and uh, that was among a couple other things, probably the greatest deciding factor. And they're going to have to get better there. They absolutely have to get better there. Uh, you know, you continue to see an escalation of tactics. Uh, when it comes to you know how to junk up the defense and really frustrate um, Trace Jackson Davis, you know we're we're now pretty familiar with seeing teams collapse throwing doubles and triples at them. Uh, I thought Arizona was incredibly effective at taking away the outlets, taking away the release uh, when they were when they were trapping like they did. Made it really really difficult for Indiana to pass out up to find the open shooter, and they were exceptional in getting back into a getting back into their defensive sets once once the pressure was uh, relieved from there. So it's going to be an ongoing process for Indiana. It's going to be a struggle, and they're going to have to continue to adjust and adapt as, as things go. But I think uh, having having Hood Shafino out there is only going to make things uh, a little bit easier for him going going down the road. Now we'll see just how effective he is when he comes back. Um, you know, keep in mind this kid's still a freshman that's only played, what, eight games now uh, on the season. Um so this is this is going to be a, uh, an ongoing process, I think, for them. Uh, but so is life when you uh, when you wear that target on your back, and you know when you're built the way Indiana is. You know the difference between Nebraska and Arizona. Um, other guys, you know, the ability to knock down some jump shots is going to continue to be a, a determinative factor for Indiana. I think. Yeah, uh, you know, you can look down the stats and they tell a, a, a story. Indiana only had 10, 10 turnovers in this game. Uh, same as this and this game, the statistics are so close in virtually every category. Um, turnovers 10 and 10, but points off turnovers that are 18 to 6. 18 yep. points off of 10 turnovers that's that's damn near unheard of. They had uh 16 points on eight turnovers in the first half, and that was pretty much your difference right there. Uh, I mean, it's it's crazy. Uh, they were so efficient with that, but they were. They out-rebounded Indiana 44-34. to 34. There's a difference in the paint, like you mentioned, 42-22. to 22. Um, And the bench, 19-17. to 17. That was the first time the bench had gotten outplayed. But Trace Jackson Davis, um, you can clearly say that he was, while he had a, a decent game, he only had 11 points on 4-10, uh, only five rebounds. Uh, and he fouls out for the second time in his career trying to deal with uh, Ballo and uh, uh, the the beef of Arizona. Race Thompson, he had 16. Now, he had a great game, 16 points, 6 of 14, 4 of 7 from behind the arc, along with nine rebounds in this game. Uh, so Race Thompson shows up, but but Trey, uh, Trace Jackson Davis is going to have to, st- when they play a team like Purdue, he's going to have to step up. He, he cannot disappear in those games. No, and this is a guy that, you know, really prided himself in the last couple of years on really, sta- you know, showing up and standing out when it came to those marquee big men matchup. And, uh, you know, he, he was able to uh, dip into that well against North Carolina. Unfortunately, Arizona was just a little bit too much. They uh, they very much had the look of an NBA team with their length, their speed, their athleticism. Uh, they really pushed tempo. They really exerted themselves inside. Um, you know, there's – he's always going to deal with the size disadvantage uh, playing at, you know, six, nine. And uh, I thought Arizona did a great job of exploiting that with Ballo, especially when you've got one of those bigs that's just beefy and almost impossible to move. I think that's going to be uh, something that's a little bit more neutralized here this weekend. Uh, Arizona, while rangy, they don't quite have the uh, the top end height uh, that, that you saw last weekend that, you know, teams like Purdue are going to pose. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for Trace to re-exert himself, I think, this weekend uh, inside the offense both uh, and, and the defense and, uh, and get back to his dominating ways. And if nothing else, providing that effective hub that the offense can, can run through. Because when, when teams have to pay that attention to him, when they have to collapse and devote all the, uh, the men 
uh, to, to, to guarding him, you know, Miller cop has proven uh, arguably be one of the most consistent players on IU's offense this year. And I, I think he is very much aware of, uh, of what opportunities that, that extra attention uh, being played to trace is providing him and he's cashing those in. Uh, if we can see some other guys continue to, uh, to contribute in that way, I think that's the dynamicism that Indiana is going to require if they're going to be a legit contender, both for the conference as well as in tournament play later.